Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome Mr. Seymour Kaplan to Kingsborough Community College today to tell you about his experiences during World War II and afterwards. Um, at 17 years old, Mr. Kaplan enlisted in the U.S. Army and left Brooklyn to fight against Nazi Germany. He became a machine gunner with the 692 Tank Destroyer Battalion attached to the 42nd Infantry Division. At the end of the war, he was one of the first American soldiers to enter the Dachau concentration camp in April 1945. As a Yiddish speaker, Mr. Kaplan served as a translator for the camp survivors. The shock of what he witnessed will mark him for the rest of his life, as he'll share with you today. When Mr. Kaplan returned home from New York to New York, he established a garment manufacturing company, eventually retired, and then became a second career, began a second career as a teacher. He is a mental health advocate and has been honored by the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I've personally enjoyed getting to know Mr. Kaplan over the last few weeks when we've been organizing this event, and I'm really excited to hear his experiences. Thank you for joining us today, Seymour. Uh, the subject that we're going to speak about really doesn't require applause. Not a pleasant thing, and I feel, you know, you, whatever, I made my mistake. Just let me take you back first to the pre-World War two days. You done? Um, I was playing ball on the street with my friends, two-hand touch, and uh, it was right near my sister's street-level apartment, and she came out and invited us to come in to watch a football playoff on her radio. I know what that sounds like. But if you live through what I lived, we saw the game on the radio. We came into my sister's house after our football game, and we were listening, I think, to a Yankee Dodger football game. And I remember Ace Parker was one of the players. We sat down, my sister gave us some coffee and stuff, and we watched that radio as if we were watching the game. Mind is, a, is as good as TV any day. And the announcers in those days were fantastic. They made you see it. You know, they say, he's on the five, he's on the 15, down to the 25. And it was exciting watching a game and listening to that. I'm giving you this little background because I want you to know the contrast between what we were doing and what was to happen a couple of minutes later. While we were listening and the announcer screaming, he's down to the 25, he's down up, beep. We interrupt this program to announce that the Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. We expect to hear from the President of the United States any moment. All military personnel, cat, Contact your units immediately. And there were a bunch of instructions that were given out that nobody ever heard before. The radio was something for fun, not for real. And that was the beginning of our life in World War II. The streets changed immediately. Guys like my brother ran and joined the services immediately. There were two things that inspired people to join. Number one, there was still a lot of depression left. Jobs were still not so easy to get. It was better than it had been, but a lot of young men had nothing to do. Number two, in my neighborhood, we were all Jews, and we all knew what was happening in Germany. We knew that they were slaughtering Jews relentlessly. How did we know? 
refugees were coming in and telling their, their loved ones why they left Germany. So that we were inspired. That was a war that America loved because we believed we were right and because we were attacked. And so it was supported unbelievably well. My brother disappeared. He went to, to the Marines and he ended up in Guadalcanal. My parents every day would open up the Yiddish newspaper and look at the casualty report. Matt Kaplan was a very popular name and almost every day they found my brother's name in the casualty list. They were going crazy. It inspired me even more. I wanted to get my big brother. I wanted to go into service. I went to my mother and said, Ma, I gotta go in. She said, you're a baby. I said, I wanna go in. She said, no, I got one on the fire. Already, I don't need two. And there was no truth. I was telling her, Mom, listen, somebody got to stop this war. It'll last forever. I got to go over and end it. And I promised her that if I got in, I would bring her a teacup from Hitler's table. And she, you know, Michigan akin, leave me alone. You're not going to, period. However, I went to the draft board where I did not need parental permission and I did not need proof of birth. I went down and I said, I'm, I registered for the draft and I put down that I'm applying for immediate induction. And it was immediate. I turned my back and I was wearing a uniform. So. I came home, I wasn't wanted to kill me, she'd really mad. And uh, I became a soldier, as all my other friends did, as the whole block did, the whole neighborhood. Guys were coming home in khaki uniforms. Took my basic training, and I went overseas as a replacement for an outfit that just got hit very hard. They brought me in and uh, I went overseas as a replacement and you, you're always moving around. You're in a box car, you're in a truck or something. They're moving you from one place to another and finally somebody said, you're gonna be assigned to this outfit. There's the 692 tank destroyers and you're one of them now. Right? And so I became a soldier, and now I had a soldier with an outfit. I had a, uh, uh, I was a soldier with an outfit. My outfit had tanks, and they carried a very big gun. They were used for tank combat and also artillery. I was put into an armored vehicle that was on tires, big, big tires, that big. And, uh, and they said I'm a machine gunner. And they put me next to a 50 caliber machine gun and said, that's your gun. I had never seen it before in my life. But that's the way the army works and somehow it works. When nobody was looking, I went to my machine gun, I started firing, everybody came out with weapons, but I had to learn. And that's the way I learned, I just did it. My outfit was by now leaving France and Belgium and we were just going into Germany. So we were leaving hostile territory, but not enemy ground. We know that soldiers in every country fight harder when they're on their own ground. And we were looking, uh, we were looking at a large concentration of Nazi troops. And 
That was my outfit. And things started to happen that don't happen in basic training. They were strafing. You'll see this on the table. That was a gift from the pilot of the plane that strafed us. We wondered why so late in the war, a lone plane would come down and straight and strafe us. We found out why. They were doing every, but, and I didn't know why. I mean, I'm a baby soldier. I'm lucky I know which one is my tank. They were doing everything they could to stop us from getting, or to delay us from getting to Dachau because they did not want that camp to be opened until they can clean it a little. We didn't know that, but we did know some guy late in the war came to strafe us, he got shot down, and we didn't expect it. At that time, we entered Munich And the fighting became very fierce after just running along, encountering a little fire. All of a sudden, a lot of troops, a lot of civilians with, with bazookas, a lot of whatever they could find to throw against us, they did. And nobody understood why. So close to their defeat, they became so active. But they did become active when we took casualties. In Munich one night, I heard machine gun fire coming from that way. And while I was listening, somebody came over and we started to talk, who the hell is down there? We don't have anybody down there, who's firing? I mean, if the enemy is firing, they're firing at somebody. Our troops are not there, nobody can understand it. I got to back up a little. Uh, when I came in as a replacement to a combat outfit, my, my fellow soldiers were really combat weary and nasty, not to me, just tired of this thing. And when nighttime came and they wanted a place to sleep, we were allowed by military law to seek a place to sleep. I think billeting. You can go to a house of the enemy and say you need a place to sleep and you can take a bed in that house or as many as you need. And we used to do it. However, our most of the soldiers in my outfit were southern kids. And when they came in and they said to the German uh, door answerers, they knock on the door and they say, how many beds you got? Those? No bullshit. How many beds you got? Nobody could understand it. And they would fight it out until they were able to just push everybody aside and take the beds. But it took a toll on them. They were tired guys after a ride. Now they got to argue for a bed when we were entitled to one. When I came in, my Yiddish was close enough to German for me to say, wie viel Betten haben Sie? Sieben Betten. Ah, good. Sieben Amerikanische soldiers do schlafen. You got seven beds, seven soldiers will sleep here. And I walk away. And it was like magic to these southern kids. That you know, they didn't know there was such a language as Yiddish. They thought I was talking German. There was a very important consequence of my speaking Yiddish to my friends to get to bed. And that consequence was when Dachau was taken by us, my colonel understood that he would need somebody or some people to keep the prisoners under control, the Jews. So he needed Yiddish-speaking American soldiers to go into that camp. My captain, wonderful guy, Ralph Floria, 
was called upon by my colonel as one of the parties that would go into the camp because he's a Jew, he'll be able to speak to the Jews. But Ralph Florio was a Spanish Jew. He could not speak Yiddish. But he remembered that he had a kid in his house getting beds that could speak Yiddish. So as I was sitting, they went into Dachau, they went towards Dachau. Uh, my outfit, the, a contingent of men headed towards Dachau and somebody came running up to me and said, Captain Florio wants you to get into a Jeep and come in. I went into a Jeep and I was selected, as I said, because I spoke Yiddish. I went into a Jeep. I had no idea where I was going. My map said Firth, Nuremberg, Munich, Dachau. I didn't know what Dachau was. I was a baby soldier. We're the dumbest guys in the world when you were a baby soldier. <coughs> when I got to Dachau, we did not go into Dachau. You're gonna, you must have heard a million times how we fought our way into Dachau. We didn't. The camp surrendered. I saw it. We did not fight our way in. But we did have to hang around the outside for a, for a while. Because I used to go into houses to empty them, into apartment houses to empty them out when I was with my unit, I used to carry a special weapon. Uh, we called it a grease gun. You couldn't aim that weapon. You just held it up, pressed a button, and it jumped all around. And when you got done, the room was, nobody was alive in the room. That's what it was for. It was for house-to-house -house combat, that's what I had. See, a rifle, if you walk into an apartment with a rifle, you're gonna hit something. You can't be, you don't have to feed them. But this gun, you can hold it close. Uh, I'm mentioning it, of course, for a special reason. And that special reason is, I'm gonna have to back up again. The special reason is, our office is new what our reaction would be when we walked into that camp. They were briefed. The intelligence had told them what to expect. They knew when we walked into that camp, if we had guns that can spit out a lot of bullets, we would use them because we were walking into hell. Not dangerous. I'm not saying, you know, a lot of shell fire, but we were walking into a place where terrible, awful, unbelievable things that happened. We were hanging around. Okay, I think it's easy to move me. Okay, you hearing me? We were hanging around on the outside of the camp as a unit and there was one officer, not from my outfit, who had taken over and he was giving us instructions, military hand instructions. He was giving us instructions to stay there. And looking into the camp, I could see American soldiers talking civilly to German soldiers. I could also see bodies stacked up from a distance. I said, could it be? They were stacked up like rice bags in one of those Korean grocery stores. One, two, three. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I thought, you know, the distance had changed my understanding of what I was seeing. Finally, the officer in charge of us stuck his hand up. That means, let's go. This means, follow me. And we walked into that camp. Wow. There was a wall of people stacked. The first thing I remember when I got into the camp that somebody had slid from that pile and were laying outside of the, the area that they were intended to be in. 
And amongst the bodies that slid, there were a few German officers, very well dressed, who were shot and killed in lying there from action that preceded our being in there. And I remember I couldn't stand looking at that German officer in his death laying amongst the prisoners. I pulled them off. Just, it was a desecration of something that was also already terrible. I remember one of the officers said to me, how high is that? How high is that body of soldiers? Uh, of that stack of bodies, I reached up, trying to get to the top. I said, about seven feet, sir. Thank you, son. That's all, just seven feet. That was the end. <coughs> and some things you just never forget, that about seven feet just stays with me forever. I worked in one school in Brooklyn where the paint ended about here and then the different color paint and I couldn't stand walking into that room because it was about seven feet. These things don't leave you. In Dachau, mayhem. A lot of small arms fire. Pop, 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 pop. And you don't know where it's coming from. It was coming from guys who couldn't believe what they were seeing and in their terrible anger because we were all terribly angry. They saw the prisoners themselves would come up to me and say, it's basically our veil. I know who I want. Give me a pistol. And that was too dangerous. We had enough small arm fire, and I wasn't allowed to give him a piss. I would love to. And I went over to one little old lady who may not have been so old. Listen, uh, I must tell you this. For 50 years, I did not remember being in Dachau. Just about 1995, the VA told me that I was there and certified it. So I don't remember things like you think a person should remember something. It's not linear. It's little explosions that somehow I've been able to reconstruct into my mind as some linear thing. But for 50 years, I had a very normal life. I had a nice wife. I had lovely kids, had good friends had a good life, but for 50 years, I did not know I was in Dachau. I'm saying that so you'll understand why I'm not linear, and then this happened, and then this happened. Just, and then I remember being with a little old lady, and she was a prisoner, and I said to her, Mama, and maybe she was very young, by the way, but she didn't look it. I said, don't be afraid. Ich bin a Yiddish boy, I'm a Jewish boy. I'm from Brooklyn. You're gonna be okay. And she looked at me fiercely and screamed at me, where is my kinder, where is my family? And she took this very actual picture out of her garment some way and gave it to me, of her family. I took the picture and there had been a wire fence someplace to my right. And it was electrified when an Nazis were in control. Of course, the electricity had been taken down by now. And the minute the electricity was taken down, the male prisoners on the other side of that fence pushed it down. So we had to scramble to get out of the way of the fence. And there was an onrush of men who had been behind bars for the last four years in these terrible circumstances. In that madness, the little lady disappeared. 
I don't know what happened to her. I, I hope she lived through it and did well, but I couldn't find her again. I had this picture reproduced and sent to a, the, the uh, Holocaust Museum sent it out to a lot of places where somebody might identify the people, but nobody did. <coughs> I left her. I can't, I shouldn't say I left her. The next thing I remember that I will tell you is that I was in a room like a tunnel. On this side, there were naked bodies stacked up. On this side, there were big boxes. You know, when you go to the fruit store and I have the big boxes for the apples this big, there were big boxes that contained clothing. It seemed to us that they undressed, they got naked, they got killed, and they were put on a pile. That's how it seemed. Nobody told us that, but that's what made sense. In that pile was a box this size and about that high. It was filled with children's gold rimmed glasses. You know those wire rimmed glasses? It was killing to see that box because you know what it represented, just like you were reading everything that happened that day. When I was teaching in that same school, every now and then some beautiful little kid would sit down next to me and she was wearing the gold rimmed glasses and I couldn't stay in the room. Me times a million other guys had that problem. Uh, on that pile, was everybody in that pile was naked, dead and naked. It's a terrible combination of emotions when you see something like that. One woman who was dead and naked had her arm hanging down and she was hanging on to a, what appeared to be a teenage girl, also naked. The teenage girl was just hanging, holding the arm, both dead. That image has stayed with me because it tells me, it orients me on what the thing was like. One of the reasons I started speaking is that I went to a Chabad, which is a, a place for, for Jews from all over the world to meet. I went to, into a Chabad and I saw Jewish kids from all over the world. And in the middle of the Chabad, there was a Holocaust memorial. And many times they would say, they'd look at that, I couldn't understand them. They spoke Hebrew or the language of their country. Many times they would hear them, what's going on? Why is it? You can't hear me? Okay. <coughs> yeah, many times you hear kids saying, uh, you don't understand their language, but the word Holocaust pops out. So you hear somebody say Holocaust, and somebody else will say, oh yeah, six million. And that gets me. Like on Pesach, Every Jew says, once we were slaves in Egypt, today we are free men. Every, or so many Jews say that, not one feels that emotional connection. We just say it. You know, you, you just say, oh yeah, yeah, very good. Where's the gefilte fish? The way it is. And Anyway, I'm sorry, there was some motion and uh, I don't have notes, so let me catch up with myself. Anyway, yes, seeing that woman holding on to what I think was her child and seeing the child holding on and both dead, it 
told me, it, it stays with me and it makes me think of what the Holocaust really was. It's not six million. It's a mother having to say to her child, don't worry, sorg sich nicht, get undressed. Everybody else is getting undressed. Who's gonna look at you? Mom is getting undressed. Can you imagine that? That's what that told me and still talks to me. The Holocaust was not just a number. It was a heartbreak that doesn't stop. The next area I remember very well, like it was yesterday, somebody said the ovens. And you know, I'm a Jewish boy from Brooklyn. Uh, to me, if you want to go someplace, it's up the block, around the corner, by the candy store. But when somebody came over to me and said, uh, in the northeast corner, I didn't know what they were talking about, but I followed the crowd. And I followed them good because I was one of the first of the crowd to be there. A million United States Army officers standing there. Uh, Life magazine taking photos. Uh, and I never saw those photos published, by the way. Life, uh, later we can talk, I can tell you why. Life magazine and the Army Signal Corps taking photos. And when I finally got into the inner crowd where I can see, there were the ovens. Orchards. A little square. There was one man, a capo, that means a Jew who worked for the Germans. And he was scared to death. He used to put the bodies into the oven. And I looked at the ovens, and on the ground there were ashes. And while he was talking, I said, those are people. I took a handful, I picked up a handful, and I said, who am I holding? You cannot be in a room full of dead people without hearing them talk. And I just went nuts from that. Who am I holding? Because I got answers. This capo was screaming and crying to us. He was scared to death. He thought we were going to kill him because a man that works for the Germans is hated by his own people. When I got there, he was screaming out in Yiddish, who did I hurt? Who did I hurt? They were dead. And I got a life from it. And it's worth it. He said, and he just kept screaming it. And I had to translate this to my over. Who did I hurt? Just sticks in my mind forever and ever. And I spoke to him because I wanted him to speak to my officers. It's, that was very important information. It was what the army was looking for. So I went over to him, as I recall, to start a conversation, and he reached into his gown. And I saw him doing something, and he took this out, and it was held by a string that he had on the... He said, for every neshuma, for every soul that I put into that oven, I made a regular labai, I made a whole funeral service. And he started to recite it. And he gave this to me, and then I showed it to my officers, and then he disappeared. You gotta understand what the camp was like. It was like the subway at rush hour times 10 in terms of moving. You couldn't walk from here to here without pushing somebody out of your way. I ended up with this. 
and I brought it home. I didn't mean to. I have a problem with some of the, uh, I'm a Brooklyn guy. I had a problem with some of the, the uh, Orthodox uh, organizations in the neighborhood. They think this belongs to them. That this little cup holds thousands of neshumas and it should be in their care where they can pray over it every day. I'm not ready to give it up. I spent a lot of time at the ovens just translating. Uh, this guy was a Polish Jew and his Yiddish was not the same as mine, but I worked it out and I was able to pass it on to my officers. Remember, I was 17, maybe 17 and a half years old. I was a baby and dumb. You know, you don't understand the world at that age. And I was hurt. But I did what I had to do. The next thing I heard was northeast corner. Remember when I told you I heard the machine gun fire? Did I tell it to you? The night before. The next thing I heard is that boxcars filled with Jews, northeast corner. I found myself heading in that direction. And when I got there, I found out what the gunfire was the night before. There were 36 boxcars filled with Jewish prisoners from another camp who were being taken to Dachau. They had been in those boxcars for 14 days, two weeks. No food, no medical attention. Hardly air to breathe and the boxcars were locked. No toileting facilities, just locked up. And when I got there, other GIs had been there before me and they were doing whatever they, you couldn't shoot the locks off because there's people inside. So they were hammering the locks off of whatever they can do to get it off. And they opened the car. In my view, the car that I saw they pulled the door open and bodies slid out on the slime that they had created. They just slid out. My memory, not much comes back from that. I just remember going through body after body after body and pushing aside, looking for someone alive. And I don't remember much of what happened, except I remember pulling bodies and pushing bodies and saying, it's a horror, I'm living in a, I'm living in a horror movie. How can it be? And the, the next thing I remember is kids, boys, maybe 14, 15 year old, wearing the Nazi hated SS uniforms, much too big for them. And they were hosing me off because I had all the human slime on them, my uniform filled with it. And they were washing me off. Let me explain those kids. Those nice, brave SS officers who were walking around able to carry this That's how they move people. Schnell, 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 eins, zwei, schnell. Those guys, when they saw that the Americans were coming in and they couldn't stop us, they took off their uniforms and put them on the kids. And they themselves took, uniform, took clothing from the prisoners so that they would look like one of the prisoners and that way they wouldn't be apprehended. I don't know if any got away with it, but we caught a lot that didn't uh, get away with it. Excuse me, I get a little loose sometimes.
Yeah, I just wanted you to know that the kids were running around in SS uniforms. Uh, Well, I'm getting a little black out here. Maybe it's enough. Okay, I'll just, we got out of the camp and I cannot tell you how many minutes, hours, or days that I spent in the camp, I don't know. I lived in, a, in an explosion of time. I hope I'm not uh, missing anything. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah. am. This belt. When you come up here to look at it, this lying belt shows what the officers, what they were trying to tell the inspectors that came from the uh, other countries to see the condition of the camp. This belt shows a shovel and a few sheaths of wheat. This was the symbol of the concentration camp. This is the belt that he had around him that this knife was attached to. A woman came up to me to tell me to kill this guy. Why did she come to me? Yiddish. And she kept saying, he doesn't have to live, shouldn't I? And you know, I think it's just like a little old Jewish lady, like my mother, wanted me to kill somebody. But that's what was going on. I walked up to him, and I said to him, what did you do? Because he was definitely a high-ranking officer. I said, what did you do? He smiled. He says, come. Send an out Juden. He says, come on, they're all just Jews. Imagine that. I told him, Ish Och. And I took out my mother's Jewish star. He said, nine. So I took from him that belt and this knife. Women came running up to me when I took that knife to tell me that this is what he used to slice their asses as he passed them. Just giving a little shot like that, that was such fun. That's, that's what the Holocaust was. He was a crazy man who loved to inflict pain on people who couldn't defend themselves. And you know, we were, we were not very forgiving. You'll be able to walk up here and see some, some of the tchotchkes. This is a belt that every German infantry soldier wore, maybe more the German Wehrmacht. There were different uh, classes of German soldiers, but this was the German field soldier. After what I just told you, can you imagine that their soldiers wore a belt that said, God is with us? Imagine, uh, take a look at it. A friend of mine wrote this book, Journey to Dachau. He was in my outfit. We knew each other well, a very... Let me just read this to you because I thought, I thought there's something wrong with me. How can you not remember what I'm talking about? Give me a second. I'm quoting from this book. During, for the past 50 years, I have been unwilling, perhaps unable, to speak or write about the war, and for me, it's nightmare final curtain in a barbarian town of Dachau. Imagine that. Same thing happened. Anyway, 
I and a lot of other guys, we saw it, we lived through it, we got out of it, but you take something away with you. I came home, oh no, after, right after Dachau. I'm saying that because I know the dates involved. Dachau was April 29th, and what I'm going to tell you now was immediately after that, it was on about the May 3rd or 4th, we heard that uh, we're not far from Berchtesgaden, which was Hitler's home, that the 101st Airborne had made a drop, they came in, they took it by surprise, and that the Americans were now in charge of it. I asked one of the German prisoners how far uh, uh, Berchtesgaden is. He said, I'll take you. So a few of us jumped into the Jeep and he took us. We went to Burgess Garden. We walked in, there were the 101st Airborne soldiers guarding the place like it was Fort Knox. Hitler lived there. And I remember coming up to this very solid looking guy and say, come on, we're American soldiers. We, you know, we're so close to this, all the shit we've been through, let us, you look at it, let us in and take a look. Hitler, I was wearing my helmet, which is the reason I brought the hat along. <laughs> I was wearing my helmet, and as we walked through an ante room, he was going to give us a little tour. I saw this shiny Anu sitting on a table, I looked at it, I said, Mama, you got a present. Put my helmet on it, and we went for a walk, and I saw the whole place, and I thanked him, and I told him it was very nice of him, and I left. <laughs> with, the rest of the, with the rest of the crowd. When I got home, I said, Ma, for you. She said, what is it? Says from Hitler's table. She said, take it out of the house. <laughs> she scared her. <coughs> so. When we got back to Munich, I had an incident that I should not forget. Now I was back to obtaining rooms for my soldiers. <coughs> Munich had apartment houses. It was a lousy job because I had to run up to the top to the roof to make sure nobody is up there and then go down door by door and make sure that there isn't a machine gun nest in there because those buildings were higher than the rest of the town and they had a good line of vision. So remember, that's why they gave me that fancy gun, which I meant to tell you, when I walked into Dachau, one of the officers ripped that gun off me because he knew anybody carrying a weapon that can shoot that much would use it in Dachau. There was a tremendous, tremendous amount of small arms fire. I saw the machine gunning German soldiers. It took people into madness. I'm not saying that they stayed mad, but at that moment, no more rules. Anyway, now I'm back in Munich, and that night I knock out a door and there's a, a lady in a nice ground floor apartment in a wheelchair. And I said to her, you'll have to go to one of your friends. She spoke English perfectly. I said, you'll have to go to one of your friends, you can't sleep here. She said, why? I said, I'm putting seven American soldiers in here. Pisher, 17 years old, I'm, I'm putting. Uh, she said, you would send me out in a wheelchair? I said, lady, worse things have happened in this war. Just get out, get with a friend. Seven American soldiers are gonna sleep here. 
She said, why don't you look around first? I said, for what? She said, know who you're sending out. I looked up and the first thing I saw was a book called The Green Mountain by Thomas Mann. I remembered that that caused a furor in America because it was a, uh, a very, very anti-Nazi book at a time when we weren't so sure we were anti-Nazis. You must understand that there was a lot of anti-Semitism in America before the war. During the Depression, it was rampant. And that book dealt with it. I was surprised to see that in the German's home because it, it was not a lot of habit. You gotta understand what Germany was. Here. This. I have it here someplace, but this is the cover of a music book. And down here is the approval by Hitler's school that they can play that music. We're talking about Brahms, I think, and they needed permission. Anyway, a book like that she could have been killed for. It was on a list of do not read and that's the way they operated and then she showed me some other things and she was a really a nice decent person and uh, then she pulled out a record of hers that she had, My Yiddish Mama, sung by Sophie Tucker. If anything can te tear a Jewish kid's heart out, it was that. I listened to Sophie Tucker singing My Yiddish Mama in Nazi Germany in 1944. Isn't that amazing? Well, it's just another experience in life, you put it aside. But a place called Ben Maxick's Town and Country, a nightclub opened up on Ocean Avenue, and they had Sophie Tuck. I told my wife, we gotta go, we gotta see this. And she knew why. And we went, and we listened to Sophie Tucker, and at the end of her performance, she had a little table set up where she was selling her records. And I, I love this story. <laughs> I walked over to her and I said, Miss Tucker. Yes. I said, uh, I gotta tell you a story. She says, go on, do it fast, I have to go. I told her the story and I said, and there I was in Nazi Germany in 1944 listening to Sophie Tucker sing My Yiddish Mama. And she said to me, My Yiddish Mama? I caught that record's Years ago, you expect me to have it here now? She missed it. She didn't get it. I think I'm done. I... Thank okay, thank you.